that's any indicator, we're in for a great service. <laughs> Good morning. <clears throat> Welcome to worship at Countryside Church. My name is Karen Epps, and I am a member of the Board of Trustees. We extend a special welcome to newcomers. Please join us for fellowship after the service so that we may extend a friendly hand. We are an intentionally inclusive congregation. We affirm the individual journey. We covenant our shared journey. We honor diversity differences, and we celebrate diversity. All are welcome. Please read and take home the announcements of upcoming events in the blue Sunday Times in your order of worship and check the ministry tables in Atherton Hall across the way for additional information. We share some brief announcements as an outward symbol that our work is worship in action. First of all, I want to let you know that the photos, <laughs> the photos that you enjoyed before were from last night's Music with a Mission. It was a huge success. Uh, approximately 150 people attended the event and the photos were taken by Bob Dow. Newcomers are invited to attend a brief orientation to Countryside Church and Unitarian Universalism. It is offered today and the first Sunday of each month following the worship service in the Stokes Room, which is in the classroom wing at the end of the main hallway. Countryside is very excited to announce that we will be hosting the Western Crescent Choir Festival on April 7th here in our beautiful sanctuary. The festival will feature choirs from UU churches of Joliet, Geneva, Elgin, Grays Lake, McHenry, and of course, our very own incredible Countryside Choir. There's not an admission charge for this event, but free will offerings will be shared with our community partners. We are expecting 250 music lovers to attend, and we need many volunteers to make this a very special event. Please visit the table in Atherton Hall after the service to find out more and to sign up to help. Two weeks from today, March 17th, is our next congregational potluck, and it's St. Patrick's Day, so that's a great potential theme. We are looking for individuals or groups to act as host. Please see the Sunday Times for the link to the online sign-up and information about what's involved in hosting. It's not difficult. Newcomers, visitors, friends, and members are welcome at all events. Please take a moment now to silence your electronic devices. Again, welcome. We're glad that you decided to spend this Sunday morning here.
makes you proud to be a human being. <clears throat> the origin of the word worship comes from the two parts of the word, the one part meaning to shape or be shaped by, and the other part meaning that which is of worth. Here we shape and are shaped by that which is of worth. And this morning, we will share the first in a series in which we'll learn from one another about the ways in which we shape this faith community with our own hands and hearts. In an age of quick clicks and texts and tweets and even email, it's easy to forget that kinship and community are made together. The best of our heritage has arisen from the magical meeting of minds and hearts and hands in the shaping and being shaped by that which is of worth. Good morning, everyone. My name is Michelle, um, and I'm one of the co-leaders of the 2030s group. I've also helped fill in as a teacher for Chalice Children from time to time. My experience with volunteering at CCUU began when I first joined this community. Before I ever helped out, I was helped by other people. The sermons inspired me and the music touched me. I enjoyed getting to know other congregants during coffee hour and exploring my religious beliefs with the atheist humanist, study, atheist, humanist and agnostic study group. But in order for me to be able to receive those blessings, a community of volunteers as well as staff was working behind the scenes. Someone greeted me at the door and handed me a bulletin. Others created the beautiful music, worked on the sound system, brewed the coffee, and washed the dishes. Someone took my child and taught him about love and acceptance right on his level so I could meditate on it as an adult with the larger congregation. Before I ever helped lead the 2030s group, others created and organized the group into existence, a group which has offered such love and support to me and many other members for the last few years. As a volunteer, I realize now that I'm not just giving and helping, I am receiving too. I have had the opportunity to play and learn with our youngest members, not strictly speaking members, <laughs> of course, who get, who get excited over simple activities like ringing a chime, sharing a joy, or doing a craft. I've been able to get to know other members of our 2030s group on a deeper level since becoming co-leader. I now look forward to serving others and look for ways to make other, others feel supported just as I have. Yes, volunteering takes time, but deeper involvement has only made my experience at CCUU richer and more rewarding. If you haven't gotten involved yet, there's plenty to do. You can start small, bring a dish to a potluck, for example, and allow yourself to grow from there. We all love the idea of community. That's why we are here. That's what Unitarian Universalism is all about. But we have community when we create the community ourselves. We could do this together. Thank you, Michelle. Welcome to all who have come here this morning, traveling, I imagine, a modest distance from a cosmic perspective. Together, let us take another journey, turning into our hearts and spirits, crossing to the hearts of others, moving wide into the world, ranging deep into the cosmos, climbing keen for hope. Welcome here to this place of respite and renewal, this place where the journey does not end. Margaret Fuller, about whom I'm talking in part today, and I did not plan this because it's the start of Women's History Month. It's just a strange coincidence. Margaret Fuller said, if you have knowledge, let others light their candles in it. Maria Popova wrote, so much of the beauty, so much of what propels our pursuit of truth stems from the invisible connections between ideas, between the denizens of a particular time and place and the mark they leave on the cave walls of culture, between faint figures who pass each other in the night before the torchlight of a new revolution lights the new day, 
with little more than a half knot of kinship and a match to change hands. Here, we light our chalice, remembering that we do live not by the light of a match, but in the smoky torchlight of the revolutions of ideas. We are blessed to be together in this spirit. Therefore, let us rise in body or spirit or both and sing our first hymn, number 347. remain standing as we join in the words of our covenant. We unite to strengthen the bonds of kinship among all persons, to promote human dignity, and to increase reverence for life's creating, sustaining, and transforming power through worship, study, and service. Good morning. This morning's story for all ages is Aliana Reaches for the Moon by Laura Rodiger, who is the former director of religious education at Lakeshore, Lakeshore Unitarian Society in Winnetka. The book was illustrated by Ariel Bora. Aliana lives in the Rocky Mountains, where the night sky holds more stars than you can dream of, and the moon shimmers like gold. The full moon lights up Aliana's entire world. Each and every morning, Papa says, it's a beautiful mountain day. What do you have planned? Each and every morning, Aliana replies, we're exploring in the woods, or I'm reading an interesting book. Today, she is reading about the moon. Sometimes, using her favorite word, Aliana says, I'm creating something special. You'll see when I'm done. Aliana has a big imagination and loves making things for her family, especially for her little brother, Gustavo. Some days, Aliana creates things in her room. Some days, Aliana creates things outside. Sometimes, Aliana creates things at night. 
Today, Aliana is baking with Gustavo. Are we making these cuppy cakes for my birthday? No, Gus. Your birthday is still two weeks away. Besides, I'm working on a secret present for you. Be patient. Aliana's creativity is messy. She often leaves a trail of treasures around the house. Her room is the messiest of all. Mama and Papa are very patient for grown-ups. But even the most patient grown-ups say, clean your room. Creativity can be a little messy. I'm experimenting to make Gus's birthday surprise just right. You'll see. Aliana's parents know their daughter is a clever girl with an amazing imagination. If she's creating something for Gustavo, they'll just have to wait. Instead of finishing her project, Aliana spends her days outside with Gus, exploring animal tracks and wildflowers in the woods. She notices things and shows them to Gus. She teaches him how to notice things, too. Mama, look what I made. You always manage to see the beauty in everything, Mama replies. After a week of hikes in the woods, a day horseback riding, and two visits to the library, Aliana spends a day playing in her room. At first, her parents think she's cleaning. Sometimes parents can be silly. She's reading to discover how to create the ber perfect birthday surprise. Aliana organizes pieces of quartz, crystals, and coins from her piggy bank into rows. Using marbles and several small mirrors, she plays with new shapes. She selects two stem vases, two bottles from the recycling bin, and one very tall, skinny drinking glass. Aliana pours water into each one and carries them on a cookie sheet into her room. Carefully, she drops coins, marbles, and pieces of quartz into five containers. She tops each one with a crystal from her collection and steps back to look at her masterpiece. Perfect. During dinner, Papa asks, did you do anything fun today? My secret project for Gus is ready. You'll see it tonight, Aliana whispers. After dinner, Gus and Aliana climb into their treehouse to read books. Gus is really excited because tomorrow is his birthday. Aliana is excited too. For weeks, she has been planning and preparing for tonight. The sun begins to set and the light in the treehouse grows dim. Aliana waits for the moon to appear in the sky. She's almost ready to show off her creation. Gus, she whispers, come with me. Aliana sees the moon reach the perfect spot in the night sky. And then, just like that, it happens. Her experiment works. Aliana is beaming. Her face is almost as bright as the full moon. The light from the moon shines through the skylight onto the creation in Aliana's room. In the window, Aliana's masterpiece sparkles and shimmers. It doesn't take much imagination to see five candles glowing. You made me a magical birthday cake, Gus shouts. We have our very own astronomer. I'm so proud of you, Papa says. Astronomers look up at the stars and they see the beauty and immensity of space and they imagine great adventures. The journey of learning more about those stars and the planets that may be around them as the Earth is around our star, the Sun. And maybe, someday, the journey of traveling to those stars and the journey of learning what is inside our hearts, minds, and spirits. To our children and young people, as you go to your religious education classes, we wish you the greatest adventure of expanding your mind and discovering new things.
for all that is given in this place. In love and generosity, we give thanks and bless one another. We come into this place each week, each day, some of us, carrying our stories of joy and sorrow, and therefore we take time in meditation, prayer, mindfulness. Let us do so now. In recognition of our deep humanity, our strength and beauty, our weakness and faltering, our vulnerability and our power, we take time. Here, where we draw together the spirit of life and love, where we gather upon the ground of being and know within ourselves and among one another the source of all. Here, where we sit in the great mystery, we take time, take a deep breath, let it expand your chest and your heart. Be present in this moment where a community of love and support surrounds you. A moment when perhaps you can remember the strength within you and the comfort that awaits you if you reach out. We live in a world of challenge, and our bodies and minds are often challenged, but we live also in a world of great healing and renewal. Know that healing and renewal in this moment, in your bones, in your heart, in your mind, and let us be refreshed and renewed together knowing that wholeness is here and healing is here among us, awaiting our attention. We make it so together. Amen. And blessed be. As I was thinking about this service, one of my favorite hymns came to mind. And it is a hymn that has moved me for many years in spite of the fact that, in fact, when I sing it, I rewrite some of the words before I sing them. I appreciate this hymn because it ties me to our great tradition, to a tradition of people who reached within and who looked into nature for answers to the questions that beset us in life. In the second verse, you'll find <clears throat> the expression self-denying, not my favorite expression. Um, and as I was thinking about this hymn, and I didn't change the words, I found myself recognizing that there are a couple ways of denying the self. One is denying that ego, the monkey mind, the busyness, and, and going down to the deeper self that knows its calling in the world. And then the other way that I found myself reframing it was thinking that instead of self-denying, it was self-defining. So as we remain seated and sing this hymn, you can play with the interpretation yourself. It's hymn 287.
Our first reading today comes from Woman in the 19th Century by Margaret Fuller. Human beings are not so constituted that they can live without expansion. If they do not get it in one way, they must in another or perish. We would have every arbitrary barrier thrown down. We would have every path laid open to woman as freely as to man. Were this done, we believe the divine energy would pervade nature to a degree unknown in the history of former ages. Yet, then and only then will mankind be ripe for this, when inward and outward freedom for woman as much as for man shall be acknowledged as a right not yielded as a concession. What woman needs is not as a woman to act or rule, but as a nature to grow, as an intellect to discern, as a soul to live freely and unimpeded, to unfold such powers as were given her when we left our common home. Let us be wise and not impede the soul. Let her work as she will. Let us have one creative energy, one incessant revelation. Let it take what form it will, and let us not bind it by the past to woman or man, black or white. Our second readings are the words of the astronomer Maria Mitchell. There will come with the greater love of science, greater love to one another. Living more nearly to nature is living nearer to the world's people. It is to be of them, with them, and for them. We cannot see how impartially nature gives of her riches to all without loving all and keeping all. And if we cannot learn through nature's laws the certainty of spiritual truths, we can at least learn to promote spiritual growth while we are together and live in a trusting hope of a greater growth in the future. The great gain would be freedom of thought. Women, more than men, are bound by tradition and authority. What the father, the brother, the doctor, and the minister have said has been received undoubtedly. Until women throw off this reverence for authority, they will not develop. When they do this, when they come to truth through their investigations, when doubt leads them to discovery, the truth which they will get will be theirs, and their minds will work on and on unfettered. Born a woman, born with the average brain of humanity, born with more than the average heart, if you are mortal, what higher destiny could you have? No matter where you are, nor what you are, you are a power. Your influence is incalculable. Personal influence is always underrate, underrated by the person. We are all centers of spheres. We see the portion of the sphere above us, and we see how little we affect it. We forget the part of the sphere around and before us. It extends just as far every way. As a young girl, I spent quite a few Sundays in Quaker Sunday School classes. To be honest, there isn't a lot I remember about those classes except some crafts. 
<clears throat> most of them took place before I was eight years old, so cut me a break. But I've always had a respect and affection for the Quakers because of their tireless work for peace and their assertion that there is a light in every person. But it was in my Unitarian Universalist youth group in high school that I got a much stronger sense of what that light within could look like in the world in my own life. From amazing murals painted by kids at UU summer camp, to stargazing, to conferences where we learned how to design our own silk screens so we could emblazon our views on our own clothing, we were encouraged to go deep and live big. Recently, I was intrigued to discover that there's an effort to begin a new Unitarian Universalist holiday right at the beginning of March called Luminescence. Now, I love the December holiday of Chalica, though not so much the name. I love Chalica because it gives Unitarian Universalists seven whole days to celebrate our principles. But what's intriguing about luminescence is that this holiday is meant specifically to celebrate the life and light within every life. I'm not sure that there is another holiday like it, one that celebrates the beauty, accomplishments, the strength, the creativity, and the potential brilliance of the human spirit. I'll give you a moment to think about whether there is one. I began to lead toward this a couple of weeks ago when I talked about our possession of some portion of the light that danced through the cosmos since the first great radiance, the new name given to the Big Bang by Connie Barlow and the Reverend Michael Dowd. I, I like it better than Big Bang, but it doesn't appear to have caught on, so it just lives in my head and the head of a few others. But there is a creative spirit in the cosmos that has given birth to solar systems and stars, planets, to our oceans and mountains, to redwood trees and caterpillars, flowers, dogs, tigers, and us. An unlikely energy, a life force, born in the sometimes cataclysmic flamenco dance of dust, gas, sparks, and gravity. And that same spirit, life force, lives on in us. And while I speak of it fairly often, the idea of focusing on it as the center of a holiday seems a great and noble aspiration. Now it's really true for me and possibly for you too. I can be bitterly disappointed by the foolish and wretched machinations of many human beings. And still I find myself more uplifted by the creativity and wisdom that emerge in so many more people in ways large and small, seen and unseen. I was thinking about this recently as I waited with bated breath for the release of Maria Popova's new book, Figuring. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, but it's, it's a little heavy, I mean physically. Finally, it arrived about a week and a half ago. I didn't wait to read it. I was excited right away by the far ranging of her mind. When a person is awake to the wonder of life, to the connections between ideas and the interconnection of all being, it's exciting, inspiring, and it gives one, at least this one, a swelling of appreciation and hope for the human spirit. As I began to read her book, I felt that appreciation and then she turned her attention to people who've truly shaped the best and deepest of Western thought, joining science and art and a sense of wonder, awe, and heart. And I nearly had to pinch myself. Suddenly I was up to my neck in Unitarians and Universalists. 
I don't think that was her intention when she started out. She was just committed to finding blazing glimmers of promise in our hearts and our world. And after she made some quick visits to Kepler and Copernicus and Einstein, she landed with both feet at Mariah Mitchell, who was, in fact, a Unitarian. Of course, when she did that, I wowed out loud as I read it. And she reminded me, without setting out to, that our history, like any sacred history, has luminous stories, and our story, ours is storied by luminous people whose lives deserve to be seen and known and from whom we can learn the lessons of the soul, hard as they are. Mitchell, as many of you may know, was a great astronomer. She began her life in 1818 on Nantucket Island in a family that had been Quaker for generations. Her father valued learning all of his children and he had moments of gentle rebellion against the strictness of the Quaker community, at times going so far as to paint many of the things in his house red, the forbidden color, and even, brace yourself, pink. <laughs> he tutored his curious daughter and all of his children when he discovered Mariah's deep curiosity about the stars which he shared, he gave her use of his telescope, and the young girl would often spend her evenings sweeping the heavens, as she called it. When she was 16 years old, she opened her own school and made it racially integrated. In 1842, for theological reasons, she gave up Quakerism and spent the remainder of her life attending Unitarian congregations. And in 1847, she discovered a comet. And after a small tussle with somebody else who discovered it a little bit after her, she was awarded a gold medal by the King of Denmark. In 1848, she was the first woman elected fellow, they had to scratch that word out on her certificate, elected fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the first woman, the next woman was a hundred years later when Margaret Mead was admitted. That was in 1850. She was also elected to the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and in 1865 she became the first female professor of astronomy at Vassar College and was named director of their observatory. She was an ardent suffragist and she and Elizabeth Cady Stanton co-founded the American Association for the Advancement of Women. She was an abolitionist who stopped wearing cotton in protest of slavery. And in the midst of all of this, she did an even more remarkable thing. She explored her own depths and the impact of the science she loved on the souls of people. She valued her relationships with others and their own depths as well. And she remained powerfully curious her whole life. She once wrote, we reach forth and strain every nerve, but we seize only a bit of the curtain that hides the infinite from us. She failed to stand up for herself when she was negotiating her contract at Vassar, so she saved up her meager wages and traveled, finally fulfilling a dream, to Italy. There, she asked to use the Observatory of Rome and discovered that it was closed to women even her. With the aid of influential friends, of whom she had many, she was granted entrance to the telescope during the daytime. <laughs> with a male chaperone, and not allowed to stay after darkness fell. She wrote, I was ignorant of the ways of papal institutions. The, gaze, the days of Galileo were two centuries since I did not know that my heretic feet must not enter the sanctuary, that my woman's robe must not brush the seats of learning. 
It was also in Italy that she spent fond time with Sophia Peabody Hawthorne, the wife of Nathaniel herself, a Unitarian. Sophia had met her husband at her own sister's remarkable bookstore in Boston called, remarkably, Elizabeth Palmer Peabody's West Street Bookstore. <laughs> it was a place where luminaries, a word most appropriate for our topic, met for books and inspiration. In 1839, a series of Conversations for Women was started at the bookstore by Margaret Fuller. Born in 1810, eight years before Mariah Mitchell, Margaret Fuller is a nearly lost figure in American history, even though her impact is felt by every person in this room, whether you know it or not. Fuller, like Mitchell, was privileged as a girl to have a father who believed in the education of women, but he wasn't as fun as Mariah's father. By, by the age of six, Margaret knew Greek and Latin, and I assume English. And then she went on to learn French and German, and eventually, ultimately, most importantly, Italian. Now, after a childhood like that, I suspect she wasn't the easiest person to get along with. But she found in the large circle of transcendentalists, who included Ralph Waldo Emerson, the Peabody sisters, and many others, minds as far-ranging and adventurous as her own. When she was 15 years old, Elizabeth Palmer Peabody met her for the first time and came away from that meeting saying, I have seen the universe. Peabody immediately called Emerson's attention to Fuller. And Fuller and Emerson had a profound, intense, though platonic, relationship for many years. But Emerson's strength of mind was not balanced by an equal strength of heart. Where Emerson spread his own ideas, Fuller became the first woman editor of a literary publication in the United States, a periodical called The Dial. Some of you may be familiar with it. In The Dial, she published Emerson, of course, and Henry David Thoreau, in fact, much of Walden, Bronson Alcott, the father of Louisa May, George Ripley, James Lowell, William Ellery Channing, and many, many others, including her own work. The Dial, as you can see, had impact beyond its own time. Many of us probably learned in school about some of these people because the dial carried their names and ideas into posterity, not knowing they were Unitarians. Through the dial, the Unitarian circle of transcendentalists were also able to foment and spread an intellectual and spiritual liberalism, and by liberalism I mean a generosity of thought, and not a literalism but a generosity of thought and interpretation, an intellectual and spiritual liberalism whose lasting imprint you can see now when you catch a TED Talk, or even when you listen to a podcast like Harry Potter and the Sacred Text, or tune into On Being with Krista Tippett. Their work, and so much more, is the legacy of Fuller and the Dial. Now, I'm not claiming that Vanessa Zoltan, Casper Turkayo, or Krista Tippett are Unitarian Universalists, though I, of course, wish they were. Only that this intellectual and spiritual liberalism that is at the root of their work saw much of its first light because of the freedom of thought, the faith in the possibility of human creativity, the willingness to ask hard questions, the willingness to be changed by new information and insight that is the heart and soul of Unitarian Universalism. As far back as you can look farther back than Fuller or Mitchell. When Emerson traveled on the lecture circuit, Fuller traveled to uncover injustices, injustices in this young country and to be a voice for the abolition of slavery and for justice and respect for Native Americans. 
where Emerson had given his controversial remarks to the Harvard Divinity School graduating class of 1838, Margaret had to petition to be the first woman allowed into the Harvard Library. But most likely her greatest impact beyond her time still was the book Woman in the 19th Century, which she published in 1843. I can only imagine that the conversations that were held at Elizabeth Peabody's bookstore served as inspiration and grist for her passionate arguments for the equality of sexes in the book. She created a space in which women could share their experiences and insights and be given courage by one another to live lives of greater radiance. Now, in 1782, another Unitarian, Mary Wollstonecraft, the mother of Mary Shelley, the author of Frankenstein, wrote a book called A Vindication of the Rights of Women, which was the first real feminist tract. But Fuller brought feminism to America when she published Woman in the 19th Century, and she took the case even further. Her writing laid down the groundwork for the American women's suffrage movement and for feminism here. When Fuller's book was released, it caused a furor. It was one thing to be a very bright woman, a curiosity like the bearded woman or Tom Thumb. It was quite another thing to demand that you and all other women be seen as the equals of men. For one thing, if all women were gonna be as smart as Margaret Fuller, what would that mean for men? Well, it was all too much. And Fuller, in that heat, as many of you may know, left America for Italy with an assignment from Horace Greeley, the Unitarian editor of the New York Tribune, who had written the introduction to Fuller's controversial book. She went to cover the Italian rebellion against the conservative controls of Austria and for the establishment of a more progressive state. In Italy, she wrote articles and sent letters home. She fell in love and had a child with an Italian nobleman, Giovanni Assoli, who was a revolutionary and she became one herself. When she finally grew homesick, she set sail to America with her beloved and her infant son, Nino. And also, as many of you may know, her ship foundered off Fire Island due to poor navigation. And she, Giovanni, and the baby all perished within sight of land. She was 40 years old. There's no knowing what new revolutions she would have fomented had she lived to 70, like Mariah Mitchell. In Popova's book, and really, this isn't a book review, she went on to write about Florence Nightingale, a universalist, also educated by her father beyond what was customary for the women of the time. Popova also wrote about Harriet Hosmer, another Unitarian considered the most notable woman sculptor of her time and a cute little woman who dressed very much like a man of the time. Without going on and on, I'll say I was wowed far into the book as I encountered another Unitarian or Universalist, largely not labeled by Popova as such. She was writing of a luminous moment and of luminous people whose light filters through to us still. But don't, as one reviewer did, make the mistake of thinking that the lives of these women are the stories simply of genius, because that's how we get trapped. Their lives rather represent what happens to the mind, the spirit, given permission and freedom, stimulation and encouragement to grow and to thrive. Their lives represent what happens when a period of history invites forth flashes of insight and the radiance of human intelligence joined with the heart. It shows that then, when those people who are liberated in mind and spirit find the means to connect with, to learn from, to inspire one another, they, they discover like the early hominids, fire. 
They discover and create this luminous explosion because they can see beyond the limitations of their time to a new world, fresh possibilities, and they can find among them the capacity to create revolutions of thought that change the world. Make no mistake, these women whose names have been made fainter by time and the men whose names are writ bolder were also fomenting at that time revolutions that changed the world. They changed it both by embodying a spirit of creative freedom and by inviting the habit-ridden spirits of human beings to join them in that freedom. That is luminescence, and it is worth celebrating. That luminescence arises not coincidentally from the faith tradition shared by these people. Sometimes we think of Unitarianism and Universalism and Unitarian Universalism as primarily faiths about what you don't have to believe. But that's not at all what it is. It's the invitation with no guarantee that we'll take it, but the constant invitation forward to greater freedoms, nobler truths, deeper compassion, to frontiers of creativity in service to humanity, beyond creed to the crux of being. Reminds me of that dense moment when all of the future, all matter, when everything was tightly bound in one small point of darkness 13.8 billion years ago that suddenly burst in a great radiance to create everything. That moment remains with us here in this room right now. But just because this invitation is at the heart of Unitarian Universalism doesn't mean that all of us here take up that invitation, does it? Because if there's one thing that the lives of these remarkable people demonstrate, it's that such luminous lives take commitment, time, exercise, learning, and practice. And remarkable lives take the making of opportunities for what the Unitarian theologian Henry Nelson Wyman called creative interchange. It doesn't happen just because you show up on a Sunday, take a periodic class, or read a book, or, or a few thousand. It happens when you do these things and you get together in groups, large or small, whether by letter or lengthy email or great blog, or even better, in face-to-face -face conversations with the courage to not only share what is in your mind and heart, but the even greater courage to be changed by what you hear in dialogue to foment together new, loving, luminous, revolutionary ideas and actions that can change the world yet again, we need to take that invitation. That is when a faint light bursts forth into luminescence. We are lucky to have fragments of this history to look back at and celebrate and learn from, and there are many more. But as Maria Popova wrote in figuring, history is not what happened, but what survives the shipwrecks of judgment and chance. Just as so much of the great vision of Margaret Fuller survived that shipwreck, so may our actions and insights in our time. To do that, we have to know and celebrate our true luminous nature, to take time to nourish, and challenge them. It's needful to focus, particularly in these disturbing and truth-tearing times, on the luminous realities within, around, and before us. It's easy to get distracted and sidetracked, to be consumed by worry and details, to let business busyness outweigh the call of our times and the deepest yearnings of our spirits. But I share with you these words that Mariah Mitchell shared with her students. She said, mingle the starlight with your lives and you won't be fretted by trifles. So I invite you, in the spirit of this possible new holiday, to mingle your own luminescence with starlight. 
Let us mingle our shared luminescence with that great radiance. And we will not be stopped by trifles, by shipwrecks, or the beasts of history. We can burst forth in creative, life-sustaining and transforming ways, and we will shine on. Let us make it so. Thank you. <clears throat> In the spirit of the music we have been listening to, I invite you to rise as you're willing and able and join in our closing hymn, Die Gedanken sind frei, or words to that effect. Thank you.